Hello and happy fucking day of February. This is No Excuses, Just Reasons with Reed Mueller. Today I want to talk about some of the vocab words in No Excuses, Just Reasons and how they should apply to you. First and foremost, why would you avoid excusing yourself but still provide reasons? These situations normally present themselves when you're dealing with family, your boss, and maybe even the general public. So like, maybe half your family is disowned from the other half of the family? and you run into someone that wasn't really part of the issue? Look, Neil, I'm sorry, but I have to treat you like shit. Our parents broke up fighting over Grandpa's silverware set. It is what it is. I'm not trying to excuse my behavior, perhaps throwing Grandpa's last empty bottle of booze at your mom because she took my favorite butter knife. Wasn't the healing moment for the family I wanted, but I do hope you find peace in the reason. As for the work situation, let's pretend when COVID hit, your office sent you to work from home. You spent a good six months to a year to two years to the next century from work from home and the product kept selling. But you know the goofballs at corporate think you need an atmosphere to run a good business. They've just been walking around the building glaring at ghosts for two years at this point. They're bored. So you've probably gotten a survey to just kind of give them your opinion on state of affairs, right? Oh, the anonymous employee survey. Considering 54% of the adult American population struggles to read at a 7th or 8th grade level, i.e. the book Hatchet. I always try to spell words wrong to try to keep it anonymous. Anyway, so the company's asking what they would need to do to make us feel comfortable enough to drive an hour to work in the office. And you know, blah 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 to all of that. But what I did make them aware of is that I felt uncomfortable returning to the office because when I worked there for the couple years prior to the pandemic, there was always at least one pregnant woman smoking. It is but my anonymous opinion, but degenerate offices should probably stay work from home. Even when COVID is over, I truly believe that my people are gonna be behind the next pandemic. So this situation put into no excuses, just reasons terms. Well, I apologize, overlords, but I just cannot trust myself to stay away from the smokers in the back. They're my favorite ones. You get some wild shit thrown at you if you stay in the break room. It's 2022. I got a mouth on me. Those are the ones that are gonna try to get me fired. Which is ultimately why I prefer the smokers. Even if I'm not gonna smoke. This isn't an excuse. However, chances of me being patient zero are much lower if you just keep me working from home. Truly though, the break room situation is just wild. I've gone back there to sit down and try to read a book for 15 minutes before, turning to the daily hell, and all of a sudden some wacko who sells nonsense prescriptions to old people thinks they have the moral right to explain to me why they're trying to get a nurse fired because she doesn't like treating potheads? I'm very pro-pothead, but you annoyed me to the point where I was like, someone should come to this office and put all of us in a van. How are we supposed to have the funding to catch the other drugs if potheads get to have a good life now? It's insane. If you're selling subscription-based turmeric to old people that can't read anymore, let the nurses sound off. They'll get fired if they aren't doing what they need to do, whereas you will continue to sell fish oil at a very reasonable price. Another break room incident I ended up having on break started by me trying to read again. Come on, office, we talk to people all fucking day. We don't need to do it in our own time. Well, someone on my project walks right up to me and starts talking shit about my coworkers. You see, she thought that she deserved all the promotions and all the special treatment, which, by the way, it blows my mind how many human beings are trying to love their job and be loved back by it. I was throwing this woman off her game. I just kept saying in return, hey, I like everybody. She'd looked aghast and then try to start up again. Well, of course, but like, I take more calls a day than Sarah. Ma'am, you work at a degenerate office. Please make your money and go home to do degenerate things. You're more annoying than the woman out back who's eight months pregnant, smoking, talking about, I hope this baby makes it. And that causes me to go hang out with the smokers during my break. They're more fun people. And then by the end of it, I'm walking away, talking to God in my head, saying, 
you make this woman a good baby. Which is very out of the realm of where I sit spiritually. Which is basically using no excuses, just reasons with God. Sure, she's smoking knowingly with the baby. Sure. But God or Jesus Christ or whomever listens to these... You'd be smoking too if you worked in this office while pregnant. And honestly, the free weekly pizza party from the hut is probably more damaging to the fetus than the cigarettes. And for a quick fourth wall breakdown, is everyone enjoying their misinformation today? Now what should our example be for no excuses, just reasons to the general public? Should it be Brett Favre hitting on the New York Jets chick with a tiny dick? Should it be Lindsay Lohan doing petty theft just, uh feel again. Should it be the U.S. government sending my own father to Vietnam via a false flag operation? Those happen, and society has to get with it. Hmm. Let's go with Packers legend Brett Favre and his tiny dick. First and foremost, society, guy has CTE. Secondly, and more importantly, he has a better dick than you. All right, thank you, Google Images, for letting me track down Brett's cock. My first impression with it is I am a little surprised that he decided that it was photo-worthy. But, you know, shrinkage is a thing. We've all watched Seinfeld. None of this concludes that Brett Favre has a tiny dick. Although, if he felt this was worth sending, we're a little concerned. I think is our end game. And just to the tiny dick community for a second... I'm sure women would rather have the semen coming out of him than the semen coming out of Ron Jeremy, right? A little male body positivity. Small boobs are still pretty great. Just think of it like that. So to kind of round that all up, Brett has no excuses, but he does have a few reasons. Reason number one, CTE. Reason number two, hey, maybe my dick's bigger than that, maybe it's not. I'm still Brett Favre. And reason number three, which is kind of a constant, I've learned from this, and I will do better going forward. Oh shit, we got some breaking news here. From the UK, the Ha Penis Project actually thinks Brett's got a fat cock. And that's a quote. The European Football League didn't end in like 2004. That's where Brett was ending his career. Oh, I don't know, Diane. America's making fun of my dick every two seconds, and the UK's complimenting it. Where should we retire? Do you remember two weeks ago when we were at that fish fry in Green Bay and the male waiter brought you a very large pickle and said, we think you've earned it? That was in Green Bay, Wisconsin, Diane. We need to leave. America's not a safe place for me anymore. We live in Mississippi, so I thought, oh, compliment Donald Trump. That'll make the jokes go away. Well, guess what? They didn't. All that ended up happening was Jen Sturger retweeted the article. With just her fingers like an inch apart. Diane just looks him in the eyes and says, Perhaps I'm not the best audience for this. Ah, Google says her name's Diana. So a little bit more misinformation. Comedy gods send me money. And before I hang up on this prayer, let me just say, Joe Rogan too. Inflation's affecting everyone. But golly, do I hope Brett and Diana figure it out. Alright, moving on to the next vocab word. This one's a little bit more close to my heart. It's more of a fashion line, which I wear sweatpants every day, so dig in. I call it Soviet attire because I just respect how those people used to dress. Plain colors, no company logos to peacock to the rest of society. We get it, you like Adidas. You're glowing more than the sun right now. It really all comes down to you want to blend in when you're out amongst the people. You never really know when you just happened to have a moment where you did a crime and you don't want to get caught for it. When I was a little chap, someone robbed our little nine-hole golf course in the middle of the night. A cop just happened to be driving by and kind of caught him. Well, guess who was running away? Four dudes in Mennonite gear. Do you think the Mennonites call their clothing gear? What's the right term for that? It doesn't much matter. They have given up on the Mennonite lifestyle. I saw a Mennonite at Walmart a while back using a Bluetooth earpiece buying beef jerky. If that doesn't prove that Mennonites are done, I don't know what will. Anyway, back to the crime. Obviously, they would have been better off in Soviet attire pretending to be a bunch of Russians or the local townspeople. Now, that being said, there's more than one way to skin a cat. In this particular crime, they were down in the basement trying to uh, wiggle their way into the safe with a blowtorch. When the cop bursted in and forced them to run away, they were at probably seven-eighths of a circle and the safe completed. 
So they were just about to get in. Little did they know we had an antique safe with a gas pipe in there. They were mere inches away from blowing themselves up and making us a lot of money in insurance. But like I kind of indicated earlier, they did get away with the crime. The cop burst in, they just ran out the back door and were running off on the golf course. And, you know, it was late at night. Cop's kind of fat. He wasn't going to catch him. And he didn't want to ruin the course by driving his car over it. Somewhat understandable. Here was the police's theory on the crime. They saw four Mennonites run away and one normally clothed gentleman. We had a crazy neighbor who owned farming property right adjacent to our golf course. Well, the police think that farmer recruited the four Mennonite men to heist us, let's say. But the police wouldn't go question him because apparently if you just own a bunch of guns and have high ground, Police will leave you alone. Yeah, we're pretty sure who it is, but they'll shoot at us if we go ask them about it, so... Dead end. My way? Wear clothing that won't get you caught. His way? Be a menace to society. The Soviet lifestyle isn't just for clothing, though. It impacts what you'll put on your vehicle. Or on your skin. You know, if someone saw you litter out of your vehicle, whoever's the snitch calling the police is gonna have a lot harder time identifying you if you don't have a bumper sticker or whatnot. Versus yes, officer. It's a white van and by the looks of it, they voted for Gary Johnson in 2016. Gary Johnson got 3.5% of the votes in Wisconsin, so that doesn't narrow down our uh, candidate list at all. And then for the skin example in which I was referring to tattoos, I was grabbing my nerve medication from the pharmacy one day and some degenerate was waiting outside to ask if he could buy them from me. He seemed like a nice enough guy. I just responded, nah, dude, my nerves suck, so I need them. And he was in reverse and spinning away from the pharmacy, basically before I could finish that sentence. He didn't threaten me in any way, and degenerates just kind of have a kinship for one another, so I didn't call the police or report him or anything. But the dude had all the classic tattoos, literally had no regrets across his chest tattoo. The moral of these stories is blend in. Society's one big small town at this point. And plain clothes are a lot cheaper. A lot less thought goes into it, which I never put much into, but a gray long sleeve shirt goes with literally anything. If Adidas wants you to wear those three fucking stripes, make them pay ya. I stand with the fruit of the loom. And with that, we're moving on to our final vocab word of the day. More a term, up. The cow phrase originates from watching veterinarians go shoulder deep up a cow's twat to help rip that baby out of that uterus. You see, I assume once you're shoulder deep in a cow's vagina, you're probably of the mindset that I'm getting this fucking calf out of here. The point of no turning back. You know who wasn't up the cow? The farmer and the Mennonites who came to rob us. They gave up, and they left the calf and the cow. Society has been begging for a new term to replace rabbit hole, and Godspeed, I think I'm the one that provided it. Oh, you went down a rabbit hole last night about the FBI? I've been up in that cow's twat for a while, sir. You want to know something that I think society's a little up the cow on? Going back in time to give young you advice. Do any of us even really remember what 2009 was like? Most people would just go back and tell young them to say retarded more. Young me doesn't need anything from old me. If anything, I need things from him. If anything, you should go back in time to young you and be a succubus. Steal some of that 15 year old's energy. It'll replenish just fine. I'll definitely hear out younger me. He's the sober one. He remembers algebra better than me. All around better human being. Just turn into young me and me both being confused at how you can divide X by Y and get a number out of that. The lowest common denominator might be 17 over 83. I don't know, this is pretend. Me just depressing the shit out of young me. Well, you know how they say that it gets better to trouble teens? Well... It also gets worse for others. Believe it or not, sometimes you'll spend a moment of your day talking to God about giving a nice woman who's smoking while pregnant a good healthy baby. And kiddo, that's probably one of your more just thoughts of the day. I don't know what the stat is in 2009, but let me tell you, in 2022, 54% of the adult population 
cannot read Hatchet. And if they can't read that, you want to take a guess of what they really can't follow? Public health guidelines. But you know, that being said, young me, people in my time are treating the unvaccinated a little... similar to cattle. But you must keep in mind, young Rito, if you ever were to have your battery die at Quick Trip, a 24-year-old liberal arts major isn't going to be the one that helps you. Your hero in that moment is most likely someone who adores the show Texas Ranger. And you know, you might disagree about some things, but Texas Walker Ranger over there is nice enough to help you regardless of that. They may leave you with a holy pamphlet, but cars running, who cares? Now I want to close out our little syllabus episode with aiming an idol for our Soviet little club. And today's idol is Gary Payton, aka The Glove, ex-Supersonic, ex-Milwaukee Buck. The Glove recently went on Bleacher Report to talk about having two sons named Gary, which is fun in itself, but also, they were born in the same calendar year. In Gary's own words, When I was dating Gary 2's mom, who I met in high school, and I got into the NBA, I had a relationship with another lady. It just so happened that they both had their kids in the same year. The glove goes on, obviously not literally. They both wanted to name them Gary. So I said, okay, cool. You can name one Gary Jr., and one Gary too. It was one of them things that worked out for me. I'm happy for that. I've got two sons named after me. We can keep the name going on. So that's all that I was talking about. Just keep my name going on. Just a sidebar quick. Naming your kid after you does not mean your soul goes on. Gary Jr. and Gary 2 are both their own people. That being said, can you believe that Gary 2 was the one that ended up in the NBA? That's some genius sports dadding. So let's all give Gary a round of applause for using mental warfare on his children. It works! The article's also stating that you pretty much can't find any information on Gary Jr. I wouldn't be surprised if they fought to the death at some point. It's just good fathering. My parents named my older brother Cain, C-A-I-N, like the Bible, in 1990. Google did exist, but my parents were doing that thing where it's 20 years ago, it's 1970, and we're never changing, baby. After that mistake, my dad did joke about naming me Abel. Can you believe that us moving to a small town America and trying to open a business didn't pan out? The townspeople. So let me get this straight. You people don't go to church. You think condoms should be sold in town. And your oldest son is named Kane? My mom was like 25 when we moved to Fenimore. And that young idiot took out a little column in the paper writing about how the Fenimore children should be able to have safe sex as an option. Hey, 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 let's just uh, pick up and move on again. Pinesdale, Montana sounds like a nice place. The idols today kind of turned into Gary Payton and my mom, I guess, but that's what we're doing. My stepdad once told some pissy customers that you'd think they'd appreciate some new blood moving into the area. You know, because a third of Grant County's all related to one another. Basketball floor slap. Once again, can you believe that this business didn't pan out? I have a lot of that DNA in me. I can't imagine either of my parents regret that shit for a moment. Most of my regrets in life, believe it or not, are not telling people to fuck off when they deserved it. And it's not like I've never done that. So we'll end today's episode with just a simple fuck you going out into the atmosphere. Kind of like those red balloons that would fall down two states over. Someone in Indiana needs to hear it. It'll work out fine. Hope everyone has a good day. No excuses, just reasons.